coding. Um, but please let me know in the chat if you have any questions. Going once, going twice. All right, so let me show you what we're coding. <clears throat> so we're gonna make a, a fun thing that's got a good name. Jaren, thanks for the question. I already answered the question. Um, the answer is so that you can go backwards and rewatch the most recent two minutes if that's what you need to do in order to kind of keep up with the typing. Um, but this is just special for today. Uh, next time we're gonna go back to regular Zoom. Okay, so what are we making? Um, this The thing that we're making actually has a name and I'm gonna tell you what the name is at the end. <clears throat> um, but it's gonna be like this. You're gonna be able to create an arbitrary number of masses, so like little point masses. And then we're gonna connect each mass to all the other masses with invisible springs. So imagine each of those lines is a spring. Um, springs have a natural resting length and we're going to set the resting lengths all to be the same. Um, and what that means is if the point masses start off in random positions, the springs are gonna exert forces on the masses. So they'll be pulling the masses towards each other in different directions because the springs are gonna all want to be at the same length as each other. And so as a result, you'll see this kind of physical simulation where over time, uh, all the masses are gonna kind of bounce around. Um, for the moment, you should, you should just think that we're doing this because it's a fun thing to do. Um, but there's actually a more serious purpose uh, for this kind of program, which I'll tell you at the end. Uh, let me just take a minute and check in the chat. Okay, awesome. <clears throat> oh. I, did, I was unaware. Okay, thanks everybody. Okay, so let's do just like a little bit of mathematical background before we dive into the actual code. Because I said there's gonna be springs that are exerting forces. What's the math behind that? I said that there's objects that are gonna have forces exerted upon them, and so they're gonna accelerate and they're gonna move around. Kind of what's the math behind that? Um, if you are in pre-calculus right now, or you had it last year, vectors are the right way to do this. So uh, this is all going to use vectors. If you haven't seen vectors before, I'm going to try and kind of give you the relevant background right now. Um, I expect this kind of mathematical background section to take maybe 10-ish minutes, maybe 15 minutes, uh, and then we'll dive into the programming. Um, so the idea of a vector is a vector represents a displacement, so the difference between a starting position and an ending position. Um, and usually they're written in what's called rectangular form, which is a delta x and a delta y. So this vector might be, for example, 5, 1, which would mean it represents the displacement of going over by 5 and up by 1. So this kind of displacement can be used to describe several things about an object's movement. So a position vector represents the displacement of your object from the origin. And that's why it's called a position vector, because if you start at the origin and you displace some amount over and some amount up, that like literally describes your location in space. Um, but let's say, but you can also use vectors for other things. So let's say I'm located here, um, but I'm moving in this direction. So this would be a position vector which I'm labeling P, and this is a little arrow on top, which is a conventional way of notating vectors. Um, so I'm located here, but this is a velocity vector that shows me the direction I'm moving in and also the speed I'm moving in. The length of the arrow usually represents the speed that you're moving. So you can imagine that in the next time step, my object is gonna move from here to there. Um, so you could say this would be like where it is at time zero, this would be where it is at time one. Um, okay, but what if we're accelerating? Uh, an acceleration is a change in your velocity. So you can also represent an acceleration with a vector. I could say I'm moving this direction, but I'm accelerating straight down. Um, and so after one time step, I'm here, but after that time step, the acceleration has changed my velocity to be angled a little bit more down. Um, this is all a little bit hand wavy right now. We'll, we'll do the math in just a second, but that's the kind of idea. All right, uh, let's talk about the relationship between position and velocity and acceleration very briefly. 
um, because all of our blobs that are going to be moving around have to have a position and a velocity and an acceleration. And they're going to have an update method, which is run every single frame. So each frame, we're going to take their position and we're going to change it based on the current speeds and accelerations. So kind of how's that going to work? Um, let's think about units for a second. So uh, we're actually use, we're actually going to be working in units of pixels and time steps, um, where time steps are in the time between individual frames. Um, and we're going to be running, well, hold on, let me show you the code. So you can, you can actually set the frame rate here inside setup. You can say like frame rate 30, um, and that makes it 30 frames a second. So you can think about the units of time now as being 1 30th of a second. Um, for me explaining the kind of mathematical background of what we're going to do, we're going to pretend they're objects moving in space. So let's use uh, distance units of meters and time units of seconds. So for position, the unit is meters. Velocity, the unit is meters per second. Acceleration, the unit is meters per second per second, which I've always thought was sort of a, a strange and confusing way to explain it. Sometimes you see meters per second squared, which is also kind of strange and confusing. Um, I'll, I'll explain in a second sort of how these units make sense. <clears throat> um, but first, let's, uh, let's imagine a scenario. So let's imagine we have an object that is falling under the force of gravity. Now remember, gravity is an acceleration. So what might be physically realistic here? So at time equals zero, maybe we're here. And then one second later, we've gone down by one. And then one second later, you know, if, if we're falling with gravity, we're not moving down at a constant speed. Our speed is increasing. So one second after that, maybe we've fallen by three more units. One second after that, maybe we've fallen by five units. And if you sort of look at this and you imagine these are the positions over time, it sort of makes sense that this is accelerating downwards. So this would be time one, this is time two, this is time three. All right, so what, what would this look like in a table? If we're making a table here, I've got time and I've got position. So I said at time zero, let's pretend this is, let's pretend this is maybe 10 meters above the ground, okay? And so if we fall one meter in one second, then this would be nine meters. And then we're gonna fall three more meters. So this would be six, and then this would be one. <clears throat> so these Y values give us positions. If you look at how the position is changing over time, so 10 minus what gives us nine? So minus one, nine minus three, gives us six, six minus five gives us one. So the units here are meters per second. Oops, excuse me. And it sort of makes sense because position is meters. So I went from 10 meters to nine meters in one second. So it makes sense that the units on this negative one should be in meters per second. So this represents velocity. And as you can see, the velocity is not constant and that's because we're accelerating. All right, so let's look at how the velocity is changing. Here, to go from a velocity of negative one meter per second to negative three meters per second, we're subtracting two, and here we're subtracting two. And if we continue this table, we're subtracting two. So hopefully from your math classes, you know that this second order change, when you have a constant second order change, that's a quadratic function. Um, and if you think about what makes sense for units here, the units of these numbers are meters per second because they're describing how does this unit change with time. Here I'm describing how does this unit change with time. So these are each meters per second and they're changing each second. So that's why acceleration is meters per second per second. Think about it grouped this way. It's like meters per second, which is your speed, and your speed is changing with every second. So long story short, and you probably already know this if you're in physics, um, velocity 
is just change in position over change in time. Acceleration is just change in velocity over change in time. Um, and these ideas here are the ones that we're going to actually have to put into code um, because we're going to have this kind of blob object and the blob object is going to have a position, but every single frame is going to represent moving forward in time. So to update the position, we're going to have to say, take the current position and add in whatever its current velocity is. And if we're accelerating, acceleration means we're changing our velocity. So we're going to need to say, take the current velocity and add in the current acceleration. So that's going to be what we're doing in the update step every single time we move all of our objects. Okay, I think, is this all the mathematical background we need for the moment? I think the answer is yes. Um, does anybody have any kind of clarifying questions so far? Hopefully the math will start to make sense when we're in the code if, if this is unfamiliar to you so far. So I'm going to take a sip of coffee, give you guys a minute to ask questions if you have questions. And my timing was right on. That was about, about 10 minutes, 12 minutes. Not so bad. Uh, all right, so let's start into the coding. Um, so here all we've got is this main. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, the processing framework, um, this size right here is telling us the size of the window that we're going to create. Uh, inside setup is where you initialize all of the objects that you'll need. Uh, and setup runs once at the very beginning when you first start your program. Draw runs in a loop automatically. And you can think about draw as drawing a single frame in the animation that you're producing. So right now we're just drawing an ellipse. Um, apparently they did not name their parameters very well. They're called ABCD, but this is the XY coordinates of the center of your ellipse. And this is the width and the height of your ellipse. All right, so let's start some pre-planning. Um, and let's just start from our main here. And you should go ahead and type along with me. Part of what I want to show you is the process that I use to program. Um, and that includes like, like how, how far do I code before I test things? And I also want you to start practicing using keyboard shortcuts that I'll show you, that sort of thing. Um, so, so let's like plan out the variables first. I already said that we're going to have like a whole bunch of blob objects and they're all going to be connected together by springs. So let's make an array list of blob objects, which I will call blobs. And let's make an array list of spring objects, which I will call springs. At this point, I want to go ahead and create kind of empty classes to represent both blobs and springs. So a good way of having IntelliJ complete this for you is you can hover over blob and you can hit Alt-Enter. And, oh, and this is an example of it doing the wrong thing. So you may notice it added an import java.sql.blob. So what that means is that there's already a blob class um, that IntelliJ knows about in somebody else's library. But we don't want to import somebody else's. We want to make our own. Um, so I guess let's do that this way. So over here, I'll say new Java class. Let's call it blob. And let's just leave it empty for the moment. And let's do the same thing for spring. You'll have to import ArrayList, and you can hit Alt-Enter to import ArrayList. Oops, I have just imported spring. So here, let's go to new Java class. We'll call it spring. And it's also just empty right now. And now I'll import ArrayList. Okay, so we've got these variables that could be holding lists of objects. We haven't really defined the objects yet. Um, inside setup, let's go ahead and initialize them. Um, this is a great opportunity to practice tab completion. So rather than typing the full word blobs, slowly type bl tab equals a r tab 
open bracket, close bracket, parentheses, etc. Oops, I forgot the keyword new. <clears throat> so same thing with springs. Don't type the full word springs. Type sp tab equals new r tab and then semicolon. So yeah, if I'd remembered to include the keyword new, there's even less typing involved. So sp tab equals n tab a tab and now I'm not going to press any arrow keys or anything. I just hit semicolon. So that's the kind of thing that I want you guys to start practicing is, is using those shortcuts to make your typing faster. All right, so what I want to do is I want to define the blob object and I want to test it to make sure it works the way that I want it to work. So let's go ahead and go to the blob class. Uh, I'm going to make my font larger so you can see it. So you always start by thinking what variables does a blob need and what methods does a blob need? So what behaviors, what actions, what commands does a blob need? You should always make your fields private. Um, so if this was last year and we were programming games, um, you would have variables. So you'd have like float x, y representing the x, y coordinates. And, and so don't type this. We're going to replace this in a second. But we've got float x, y is the position. And then if we wanted speed, I think last year we called it like x speed and y speed, something like that. Um, and like that's fine. You could totally write code this way. Um, but at the very beginning, I told you all about vectors and I said that they were kind of the right thing to use. Um, the reason they're the right thing to use is because they make all the calculations that we're going to do kind of much more concise. And if we use a library for vectors the way that we're going to, um, processing has a built-in vector object. Uh, it already has a lot of the calculations that we'll need built in. And so you'll see kind of how nice and compact it is when we use it. So um, we'll need a position and a velocity and an acceleration. But the data type is going to be called p vector. And p vector is the built-in vector object in processing. So I'm going to call it position, velocity, and acceleration. And then you've got to import p vector. So I'll click there and do Alt Enter. Um, let's go ahead and create the constructor. If you don't know, you can have IntelliJ automatically create the constructor for you if you do uh, alt shift a or no sorry control shift a control shift a um, and then you search for constructor uh, and then hit enter this is a, a wizard that will create your constructor for you so i think i only want to construct blob objects with their position but i don't want to initialize them with an acceleration or a velocity because i want them to start off not moving and not accelerating. So I'm going to click OK just with the position vector there. And so you can see it's created my constructor, but I still need to initialize all the other fields. Um, if I don't, these currently contain the value null um, because they're variables that are pointing to an object and we haven't created any objects. So null means that it's a null memory reference because there is no object to point to yet. Um, so let's go ahead and create those. So I'm going to say new p vector. 0, 0 means that it, it has a delta x of 0 and a delta y of 0. And then we've got acceleration will also be, ah, will also be 0, 0. Okay, so I'm feeling good about the variables involved with blob. Uh, let's think, what else might blob need? Um, I guess if we're going to display it, maybe we want a size that it displays at. Um, later on, maybe you want to give them different masses so that they kind of affect each other differently. They pull each other differently. Um, but right now, I think let's leave that out. So let's make a private int size. Um, if you want to add a color so that they display it different colors, you could also do that if you remember how from last year. Um, I guess, I guess let's add to the constructor. So size, and then we'll say this dot size equals size. Oh, sorry. So notice, notice the tab completion again. So you don't have to type this. You can type th tab and then a dot. And then it'll auto complete probably even to the right thing. 
and you hit enter and then equals and then s and then tab and then semicolon Someone's asking, is there a place where we can view all the keyboard shortcuts? Well, so IntelliJ has a lot of keyboard shortcuts. Um, so the answer is no. Um, but the Control Shift A that I mentioned, this is a search bar that will let you search for what are the keyboard shortcuts for different tasks. So let's say I want to, uh, let's say I want to rename something. Oh, it's not showing me the shortcuts, is it? Well, that's irritating. Well, I had believed that on the right-hand side it was going to... Oh, no, so here it does display for some of them. Um, so if you want to, like, refactor something, you can see all of the possible actions that are, like, refactoring, and you can see what the hotkeys are for them. So if you ever forget hotkeys, you can look them back up again using this search bar, which, again, you do with Control-Shift-A. Um, keep the questions coming. So, all right, so we've got a blob. We have enough variables to move it around if we want to move it around. We can display it on the screen. Um, before we, I've said before that you want to code the smallest thing you can before testing to make sure that something works. So I'm not going to worry about how am I going to move it around yet. Um, I'm just going to program enough so that I can create a blob and display it on the screen, and then we'll come back and worry about the movement. So let's make a method called draw, <clears throat> public void draw. And if we're going to copy what we had in main, remember the command said ellipse, and you give it an x and a y and a width and a height. Um, so here we don't have variables x and y, but we do have a position vector. Um, and if you remember, here, let me... Let me get my document camera for just a second. So here's the document camera. If you remember the idea of a vector, the position vector is going to tell me, so this is our position vector here, and it's gonna tell you the change in X and the change in Y that describes the coordinates on the screen for your actual object. Um, and if you're cha and like a change in y from zero just gives you an x coordinate and a change in y from zero just gives you a y coordinate. So that's what we're about to do. Um, and if you have a vector, the way that you access the x component and the y component, they're just public fields inside your vector. So you just say position.x and position.y. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll say uh, position.x, position.y, and then because they're circles, the width and the height are the same. So we're just going to use size for both. And that would be it, except for the fact that uh, ellipse is a command that only exists inside a p applet. P applet is means sort of like graphics window. It's the class where all of the drawing methods are defined. Um, and here, the blob is not a graphics window. Um, and we don't want to say blob extends p applet because that would be saying the blob is a subclass of a graphics window, which is sort of like saying blob is its own special kind of graphics window. But that doesn't really make sense. We only want one graphics window on our whole program, and here it is, it's main. Um, instead, we need to pass the graphics window as an input to the draw method so that that way it's accessible and the blob can say, hey, graphics window, please draw an ellipse for me at this location. So uh, we're going to say p applet window. That's going to be the input. You've got to import it by saying alt enter. Um, and now we can ask the window object to do the drawing for us here. Uh, yes, so someone in the chat is saying that p applet um, is not actually related to the swing class applet, if you know about that. Um, and that's true. It used to be in a previous version of processing, but they changed it so that it's not anymore. Okay, so so far so good. So we've got, uh, we've got our blob object. We should be able to draw it to the screen now. So uh, let's, 
let's actually set the fill color. We're gonna fill it to zero, which is uh, black. And this should be enough that we can actually test to make sure everything draws. So let's go to main. Um, I'm not gonna create a whole bunch of blobs yet. Let's just create one, because that's the simplest thing we could try um, and just make sure we can display it okay. So up here, I'm gonna make a blob called B. Inside setup, I'm gonna say B equals new blob. Um, we have to pass it a P vector as an input. So I'm gonna say new P vector. And where do we wanna start it? Let's start it somewhere in the middle of the screen, like 300, 300. And then let's give it a size of 30. Um, you have to import P vector. And then down here in draw, I'm gonna delete ellipse. And instead I'm gonna say B dot draw. And I'm gonna give it as an input the keyword this. The keyword this refers to the currently executing object. So in this program, we're here inside main. So the keyword this refers to main. Um, and you can see here that main extends p applet, which means that main is a kind of graphics window. So as you remember, draw was expecting a graphics window as an input, and so we're we're giving it ourselves. We're giving it the main object, which is a graphics window as an input. And then the blob can draw itself by asking the main window to do the drawing for it. So let's go ahead and run it. Make sure we see something that makes sense. Cool. So I see a black circle and that's what I was expecting to see at about 300, 300. All right, uh, let's take about a, a three or four minute break right now, just in case people need to catch up. If you're someone who needs to catch up, you should definitely go backwards in the live stream by two minutes or however far you need to catch up. Um, and please catch up. I probably can't do any interactive debugging with you right now over the live stream. Um, so do your best. Um, I mean, you're always welcome to ask a question in the chat and maybe other folks can help. Uh, but I'm going to pause right now for about three minutes. So you can feel free to go and get your own cup of coffee, get a piece of pie, a nice after dinner snack. If you're wondering why I just said dinner, it's because my three-year-old has ruined my ability to say the right meal name. She calls lunch dinner, and she calls dinner lunch, and she calls breakfast dinner, and somehow it's infected me. And now I can never say the right thing anymore. Hello, Bionic from Precalculus Honors. It's nice to see you. I hope this is a nice application of vectors for you. Hello, Sarah. It's nice to see you. Alexi is saying, isn't it possible to make a class within the same Java file where p applet is in it to avoid using p applet as a parameter? Uh, yes, so if you wanted to make blob be a class inside main, you could do that. Um, I mean, to me, I don't see like a particularly strong reason to do that. Like, I, I think it's it's a pretty standard pattern to to do something like what I'm doing in draw here. So I don't think that that's unusual. Uh, if there's no constructor in your actions, then you can just go ahead and, and type the constructor the way that we have here. <clears throat> it's just like a nice shortcut to automatically have it generate a constructor. Um, there's other hotkeys to do the constructor generation. I just don't remember what they are off the top of my head. Instead of control shift A to search, you can also hit shift twice in a row. Um, I don't know the difference between these two searches. Maybe they're the same. 
Um, but you should see constructor at the top of your actions if you start to type constructor. Let's wait one more minute and then we'll take the next couple of steps. Uh, expression expected might well be that you your curly braces aren't matching. Uh, array list in red means that you didn't import array list. Um, so you can you can put your cursor on it and hit alt enter to import. Or if you want to, you can just type directly here import java.util.arraylist. Either one. Ah, forgetting to type new. That's good. Okay, awesome. Um, let's let's go forward. Um, so before doing any of the movement, mm, no, yeah, let's let's do the movement now. Actually, so let's go to blob. Um, we're gonna have a method called accelerate, which is a way of adding an acceleration to the object based on a force. Um, because we're going to have springs that are going to exert forces in particular directions. Um, if you, again, if you are in physics, you may know, a, even if you're not in physics, you may know a very famous equation, F equals MA, which means force equals mass times acceleration. Um, to make all of our calculations simpler, I'm just assuming mass is always equal to one in whatever units we happen to be in. So for each of our blobs, force is just going to directly equal acceleration. So what that means is if we've got a blob here and a blob here and a spring that's connecting them, um, let's pretend our, our spring is contracting. If our spring is contracting, then that means it's going to exert a force in this direction, in the direction along the spring, um, of a particular length, and we'll figure out how to calculate that in a minute. Um, and that's, that's the force that's acting on the blob. Um, if no other forces are acting on the blob, then this force is exactly the same as the acceleration. And remember, an acceleration tells you how your velocity is going to change. So whatever the change in x and the change in y, whatever that change in x and y is for your acceleration, that's exactly how much you're going to change your velocity by. So your velocity, let's pretend, let's pretend my current velocity is this way, so it's moving up. Um, that means in the next time step, I'm going to take this delta x for my velocity, and I'm going to subtract this delta x for my acceleration. So it really is like acceleration equals acceleration plus, oops, excuse me, velocity equals velocity plus acceleration. Um, and this covers both x and y. So you can think about it as saying velocity x equals velocity x plus acceleration x, and then another equation for the y's. But one of the nice things about vectors is uh, you just say it once, and it does both dimensions at the same time, both x and y. Um, okay, so what did I, was there anything else I wanted to say here? I don't think so. Let's go back to code. So we're going to have this uh, method called accelerate, or maybe I'm thinking, should it be called add force or should it be called, let's just call it accelerate. Um, and we have to give it an acceleration as an input. So let's give it a P vector, um, which I'll call F. Here on the inside, let's remember our equations here. So acceleration is going to equal F over M, force over mass, um, but mass is 1 for us. So this is just a little note to myself to kind of remember what was happening here because later on if we come back and want to change it, you know, this has reminded us. So what I just said was we want to take, take our velocity 
So you can type this dot v tab and we want to add in the the force because that's the same as the acceleration or no sorry we, let's do this let's actually add it into our current acceleration so i'll say acceleration plus what's it called oh it's called add f So the way I'm imagining this is we might run the accelerate method several times with several different forces. Because if you imagine an object that's connected to a bunch of other objects, um, you know each of those springs is going to add a force pulling our object in a different direction. So every single time we want to add a force, we're going to run the accelerate method and say, here's the force we're adding. And then all of those forces together get added into acceleration. Yeah, good call. Um, just to be really clear, if you've been in physics before, you might have seen like a like a static, what's it called? A static force diagram or like a, I forget what it's called. Um, but anyway, it's a diagram where you try and pay attention to like what are all of the forces acting on your object in different directions. So you might have a force pulling it down. You might have a force pulling it this way. You might have a force pulling it that way. And in physics, you'd write F net, meaning the net force. And the net force is what you get when you add up all of the forces. And so that's what we want to do with our accelerations. If you imagine that this is our point mass and these are all springs, each of those forces is an acceleration. And so we would call the accelerate method for each of those. And what that's going to do is it's going to take our current acceleration and add in whatever the next one is and take the current one and add in whatever the next one is. So that's going to let us figure out what's our – oh, free body diagram. That's what it's called. Thank you. Um, it's, been, it's been a long time since I've thought about physics. Um, so uh, right. So that, that's what we're doing with the accelerate method here. All right. Uh, cool. So now that we're accelerating, let's actually move the object. So it's going to be public void, and I'm just going to call it update. Uh, if you wanted to, you could maybe call it update position. Maybe that's a little more explicit. And I, it doesn't need any inputs because it already knows what its own acceleration is. It already knows what its own velocity is, all that. So this is how we're going to tell each object, hey, take your own current speed and acceleration and just change your own position. Um, so now we're going to do kind of the math that I said at the very beginning. Um, so the velocity is going to update itself according to whatever our acceleration is. Um, so each of these is a vector. And I'm saying take the velocity vector and add into it the acceleration vector. And hopefully the acceleration vector has been set before now Use it by adding forces into it using that method. And now that I've updated the velocity, I want to update our own position by taking our current position and adding the current velocity. And then the last thing that I want to do is I want to take the current acceleration and I want to set it back to zero again um, because I want to like stop accelerating it and let the next frame add all of its own accelerations fresh because uh, otherwise we're sort of accelerating at each frame um, and it's going to like really speed off the screen instantly. Um, the question is, is there a clear? So, so I forget what methods are inside the P vector, but this is a great thing to do with objects. If you don't remember what methods they have is you start with the name of your object, you hit dot, um, and then you sort of like look in the list and see what's available here. And I was trying to see like, is there an easy way of setting it to be zero? Let's try set. Yeah, so this looks good. So I can set the X and the Y components separately. So I'm gonna set it back to zero, zero. So that's now reset the acceleration. Yeah, cool, thank you. Um, all right, so let's step back and think about this. Um, that makes sense. So let's go ahead and like test that much out. So let's go back to main. We've got our single blob object. Um, Let's go ahead and try and update our blob object by pulling it downwards with an acceleration due to gravity. So b.accelerate, I want to accelerate it downwards, so I'm going to make a new p vector, 
whose X component is zero and whose Y component is like one. I don't know if that's gonna be too fast or too slow, but we'll see. Um, so this is a vector that's pulling us down by one. Oh, you might be wondering why is this one instead of negative one? Um, the answer is it's because of the crazy coordinate system that computers use. So if this was math class, uh, this would be accelerating us up. Um, if you don't remember from last year, the coordinate system on the screen is uh, zero, zero is in the upper left-hand corner. And Y coordinates increase as you go down. So at the bottom of your window, it's 800. At the right-hand side of your window, it's 800. So if I want to add an acceleration that's going downwards, um, it's going to have uh, a delta X of zero because it's not going back and forth at all. Um, and the delta Y is going to be some positive number for how far down we want to change the velocity. Um, the reason we're not, you, so, so someone in the chat is saying negative uh, 0.981, um, but that's in a particular unit, right? And on the screen, our units are pixels per 1 30th of a second. Um, so it's sort of like not clear what the right unit is going to be for a physically realistic simulation on the screen, unless we want to, you know, do some unit conversions, which I don't really want to do. Um, I think it's nicer. Let's just set it to one, see if it seems too fast. And if it's too fast, we'll make it slower. And if it's too slow, we'll make it faster. Um, the reason we don't need to set a velocity first um, is because we want it to start off not moving at all. We want to let the velocity slowly increase due to the acceleration of gravity. All right, so I think, all right, so we're accelerating it, but it's not actually going to move unless we say b dot update position. So we're adding an acceleration each time step. We update the position, we draw it, and then we repeat back from the top. See what it looks like. Cool. Um, so you might notice that we're seeing the history of all of the places that it used to be. Um, that's because uh, you don't automatically clear the window between frames. So let's add a command that does that. At the top, you can say background 255, which is white. So clear frames with white background. And now we can run it again. Oh, you can't see it? Oh, oh no, all right. Sorry, I forgot to, uh, ta-da! <laughs> now the 30 second lag is really, it's really a problem. Okay, so you can hopefully see what I've got here. Thanks everybody in the chat. <laughs> So you see it slowly accelerating downwards with gravity. So I wanna pause for a second and take note of the process that I'm using here. You know, I said at the beginning, we wanted a whole bunch of blobs connected with springs and they're all moving around. But if you look at how I'm actually programming it, um, I started by just making sure I could draw something. And then I made a blob object and I made sure I could actually draw a blob object, but I didn't do the motion. And now we just did motion and we were making sure, can we make one blob object move? So you see I'm programming in like these little tiny steps. And what that means is, like, let's pretend that I made a mistake. Oh, I should have made a mistake on purpose. Um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure it'll happen before the end of the video. Um, so if I made a little mistake, now there's sort of like no question where in the code the mistake happened because I only really wrote like these two methods, right? That's like four lines of code. Um, so it makes the debugging a lot easier. Um, you know, if I had started by making a whole array list of blobs and I'd done all the movement and all of the spring physics and everything before I'd tested it at all, then it would be quite hard to, to debug potentially because it's really hard to kind of narrow down where the problem is. That's one of the main issues with debugging is um, like once you know where the problem is, it's often a lot easier to figure out what the problem is. Okay, let's, uh, let's maybe take one more minute uh, I'm gonna run. I'm gonna run off for about 30 seconds, but take a minute and catch up if you need to catch up. I'll be back in like one minute, and then we'll continue on.
Uh, I probably should have said this at the beginning, um, but if you are somebody who is not part of my AP Computer Science class, um, probably none of this is working for you because uh, we're using a special library called Processing. Um, and so you need this jar file, which you can download from processing.org. Um, I mean, if you're, maybe I can post, like once this is a pre-recorded video in the description, I can maybe post some instructions for that if you want to like go back and, and do it. Anyway, uh, let's continue on. So we've got, we've got a blob. The blob can move around. I think it's time for springs. So let's like start by making our spring object and then we'll think about the physics for a minute. So here's our spring object. Um, let's make private fields. So there's kind of two facts about springs that control their behavior. One is uh, their natural resting length. So if you haven't like squished them or stretched them, like how long do they naturally want to be? Um, what should I call that? Maybe I'll just call that length. That seems fine. Let's give it a <laughs> data type. Okay, so length. Um, and then the other thing is called the K value. Um, let me tell you what the K value is if you don't know. This is again, kind of a physics thing. So the K value is used to determine the force that a spring will exert. So let's say, let's say this is my spring and let's say this is its natural resting length, which I'll describe as L. No, I'm gonna describe it as R for resting length. Okay. Um, if I stretch my spring longer than its natural resting length, um, it's going to exert what's called a restoring force, like back in the direction that it wants to go in. And the strength of that force, let's call this D for displacement, the strength of that force is K times D. Um, and we're, we're gonna think about sort of the, pos like should this be positive or should this be negative in just a second? Um, so right now, let's just think about the absolute magnitude of the force. Um, but it sort of makes sense, like the further you stretch it past its resting length, the stronger the force you're gonna feel that's pulling it back in the opposite direction. Um, and K is that proportionality constant. Um, and like in actual reality, K is determined by like the geometry of the spring and the thickness of the material and maybe the specific like, you know, uh, like type of metal that it's made out of, or if, if it's not metal, like, you know, the specific material it's made out of. Um, when you buy springs at the hardware store, like if they're nice springs at the hardware store, very often on the package, it will tell you what that K value is. Um, for us, you know, we're just going to set some random numbers until it looks good. Um, but anyway, so that's the force that the spring is going to exert. Um, except for us, like all of these are still vectors. So if we imagine here's a blob, here's a blob, we've got this imaginary spring between them. Um, if this spring has been stretched past its resting length, let's label our blobs B1 and B2 this string is going to exert a force on blob one in this direction, and it's going to, sorry, on blob two in this direction, it's gonna exert a force on blob one in this direction. Um, we said that the force is going to be equal to K times that displacement. Let's say R equals rest le resting length, and let's say L equals the current length. So we're going to think about kind of positive and negative in just a second here. Let's put this on a plane. Um, let's pretend this P1 is the position vector for blob one. And P2 is the position vector for blob two. Um, if you know about vector addition, what I'm going to do make, will make sense. If not, it, it might not. Um, but the way vector addition works is, um, like, let's say I want to figure out what's the direction of this force right here. It's like P1 plus this vector here should equal P2, um, assuming this vector is the length of the spring. 
So like this arrow plus this arrow is the same as that arrow. Um, and I don't want to explain more about vector addition right now, but hopefully that's familiar if you know about vectors. So I've got that P1 plus F equals P2. If I want to solve for F, you can just use algebra, right? You can solve, you can subtract P1 from both sides. So the force is going to be P2 minus P1. Um, and that's going to tell us the direction of the force, um, but it's not going to tell us the strength of the force, the magnitude of the force. This equation is going to tell us the magnitude of the force. Um, and it's going to be like R minus L or maybe L minus R. So let's, let's now go ahead and think about kind of pluses and minuses and what makes sense here. Um, so let's pretend, so let's pretend that the spring has been stretched longer than its resting length. So its current length is bigger than resting length. Um, in that case, this value right here is gonna be a negative number because I'm subtracting a larger thing from a smaller thing. Um, so the question is, is that really what I want? And I think that the answer is no because a negative number would mean that the force was acting in this direction, but we really want the force to be acting in that direction. I think what I'm saying makes sense. So let's go ahead and, and make this the other way around. Let's make it L minus R. So now the force is gonna be acting in the correct direction. Um, it's, it's very possible I've made a mistake here, but the good news is if I did make a mistake, what we're gonna see is uh, objects pushing away from each other instead of pulling together. And that should be very obvious if that's happening. And then all we'll do is we'll reverse the sign on that to fix it. Okay, if that was like very mathematical, I apologize. So here we are in a spring. Um, let's make a constructor. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. I'm gonna hit Control Shift A. I'm gonna start typing the word constructor, hit enter. Um, I think this constructor, I'm gonna select both of these. You can select both of them by holding the Shift key or the Control key. And while you're holding Shift, you click. Looks good to me. I guess maybe this only makes sense if we want to have different K values. Maybe we should make K a constant. Well, I don't know. Let's leave it the way it is. Um, so there's our spring. I think that what I want to do is I want every spring to be attached to two blobs. Um, so let's do this. Let's make private blob B1, B2. Um, and actually, I'm going to regenerate the constructor now because I want to actually create the spring with the two blobs it's attached to. So what that means for us is we're going to have to create blobs first, and then after all the blobs are created, that's when we hook them together with springs. So let's recreate the constructor. Um, and now, now I've had a change of heart. Now let's not put K in the constructor. <laughs> let's just do that there. I mean, I guess you can do whatever you want. So if you want K in the constructor, go ahead and put it in there. Um, I'm gonna give K a value of 0.005. Uh, the F at the end of this number means treat this number like a float instead of like a double. If you leave the F off, it's gonna complain at you and it will say required float provided double. So this is sort of like a shorthand way of like casting a numeric constant. Okay, so I've got the constructor. Um, like the main thing that I want a spring to do is exert forces on the blobs. So, uh, I'm just gonna call it move blobs. Maybe there's a better, maybe there's a better method name for that, but I don't know what it's gonna be. Um, okay, so let's start to figure out what we need to do here. Um, so I'm, you can't see it, but I'm looking over at the math that I just did on my piece of paper. So let's make a new P vector um, called acceleration or called F for force. And the P vector is going to be, let's see, I said the position vector for blob two minus the position vector for blob one, if you remember that. 
So let's do blob two dot get position, which apparently we haven't made that method, but we are programming by intention. So we're pretending that we have a way of asking the object for its position and we'll fix it in a second. Let's go ahead and alt enter to import P vector. Um, let's go ahead and add get position right now. So if I hit alt enter on get position and say create method, it'll jump me right into the blob class. And here I'm just gonna say return position. At this time, I'm gonna teach you another keyboard shortcut. If you hold control, then hold alt, and then hit the left arrow. So control, alt, left arrow will jump you back to the position you were just at. Control, alt, right arrow will jump you forwards. If you hit control, alt, left arrow a couple of times, it will go through the history of your cursor positions. Control, alt, right arrow will go forwards in the history of your cursor positions. So it's like, it's like forward and backward in your browser. Um, so it's, it's a nice way of like rapidly navigating around your code. Um, let me show you another thing. If you hold the control key and you click on get position, so hold control key, click there, that will jump you straight to that method. And then if I wanna go back, control, alt, left arrow. So uh, you should practice not clicking around in tabs and scrolling up and down because that's like a very slow way to navigate if you can avoid it. Instead, you should practice just directly control clicking on a method to jump you there and then control alt left arrow to jump back. Okay, so, so what was I trying to do? Oh, I was trying to subtract things. Okay, so I've got the position, I've got B2's position and then I believe, yep, so I can subtract another vector from it Ooh, is that gonna is that gonna change my position though? I think it might. Let's not do that form. Sorry. Let's do p vector dot subtract. Yes. Um, I'll tell you why I made this change in just a second. Um, so I want blob two's vector, and I'm subtracting blob one's vector. Okay, great. Um, so mathematically, we're saying that our force is equal to this position vector minus that position vector. Um, and we know that that's pointed, we hope, in the right direction, but it's the wrong magnitude. It's the wrong strength. Um, so the reason that I made this change is if I say B2, or let, uh, don't type what I'm typing. I just want to show you a quick thing. So if I say B2.getPosition, if I say position dot subtract, and then I have another p vector in here, um, it's actually going to change the coordinates inside this vector. Um, but this vector is actually still connected to my original blob. So when I do the subtraction, I'm not actually trying to change anything about my blobs. I'm trying to make a completely new vector that's that's pointed in the direction of the force. Um, so this is not a particular vector. This is the p vector class. So this is a static method. Um, and the static method is gonna create a completely new vector that's the result of B2 minus B1. So that's why I made that change. All right, so I've got a vector that's pointed in the right direction. Now let's scale it. So I'm going to set the magnitude. Um, what did I wanna set the magnitude to? Let's go ahead and calculate it first. So I'm gonna set the if you don't know what the word magnitude is, it means like length of your vector. Um, so first, let's figure out what is the the current magnet. Wait, what are we really trying to do here? Oh yeah, all right. So we're gonna do k times, and then I said it was l minus r, right? And l represented the current length of the vector. So the current length of the vector is f dot magnitude. That is the distance between the two, the two points. And then R is the resting length, and I called that one length. So I'm saying take the take how much the string, the spring has been stretched, because that's the distance between blob one and blob two. And now I'm saying subtract what its resting length was, and the resting length we set in the constructor up here. And then let's multiply that by whatever the k value is. 
um, and that should be the magnitude. So now we can say f dot set the magnitude to that thing that we just calculated. Um, and now we're ready to accelerate the blob. So that's going to be b1 dot accelerate, and I'm accelerating it using f. Blob two, I want to accelerate in the opposite direction. So let's do f dot multiply by negative one. So this reverses direction of force. And then I'll say b2 dot accelerate by f again. So in summary, we're doing some math to figure out the direction of the force and the magnitude of the force. Then we tell the blob one that we want to accelerate it by that force. And we then we reverse the direction of the force. Why are we reversing the direction of the force, you ask? Good question. Um, so if the force is pointed this way, we want to accelerate blob one this way. Blob two, we want to accelerate by the same amount, but in the opposite direction. So that's why we're reversing the direction. Um, so then we've got B2 dot accelerate in the other direction. I will now pause for a minute. And then uh, are we in a good position to test? Yeah, maybe. Well, how are we doing on time? We get out at 145, is that right? Yeah, All right, I think we're doing okay. We're gonna make it. Hmm. Molt is red, huh? What's the data type? Is is f really a p vector? What you can do is you can say f dot, and it should like autocomplete, and you can go down until you see molt. The only reason I can imagine why molt might not be there is if f is not actually a p vector. Um, so set mag is setting the magnitude, but it's not changing the direction. So you can imagine it as rescaling your vector. Uh, interesting. I wonder if you guys... So yeah, so try this. Type P vector all, like capital P, capital V, and then dot. And if you start typing, you should see sub there. Oh, yes, there is a comma. That's true. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're not saying, right. So what we actually want to calculate is this minus that. Um, but sub stands for subtract. So we're saying start with this thing and subtract that thing. Yeah, so as, as Jaren's been mentioning, um, like in some languages, there's something called operator overloading. So you can you can like redefine like the normal like plus minus divided by and you can say like for your own objects how should those behave and then you really could do something like say b2 dot get position minus b1 dot get position and that would all work um, Java does not support operator overloading so that's that's why we're doing that okay uh, let's pause for one more minute see if people have remaining questions All right, so let's test what we've got so far. So I've got one blob, let's make a second blob. Um, let me show you a neat trick here. So I wanna rename B to be B1. So if you hit Shift F6, yeah. So step one is put your cursor right on the variable you wanna change. So for me, that's B. Then hit Shift F6, um, for you, uh, on my keyboard, I actually have to hit the FN 
key in order to get to F6, otherwise it does something else. Um, hold on, let me show you what it looks like. So it looks like this. And then you'll notice I can type whatever and it's dynamically changing all the instances of that variable name. So this is like you're changing all the variable names all at once. So I'm gonna rename this B1 and then when you're happy, hit enter and that will update everything. Um, if you click outside of the box as you're typing, then you have to like click back inside the box and it's kind of a pain. Um, if that doesn't work for you, that's okay. I just, you know, it's a nice thing to be able to do. So there's blob one, let's make blob two. I'm gonna create it down here. Um, in order to make a controlled test, let's have it be at the same X position, but let's have it be like 300, oh no, sorry, let's have it be at the same Y position, but let's have it be 300 pixels to the right. So I've got two vectors that are kind of horizontally across from each other. And now let's make a spring, which I'll call S. And then down in setup, we'll say S equals new spring. And we're gonna give it blob one and blob two. And then we're gonna give S its natural resting length. And I want the resting length to be smaller than the distance between the blobs. So that that way I know the spring is gonna start out being stretched and I should see the blobs pull closer together. So let's make the resting length be like 150 maybe. And now it's unhappy for some reason. Oh, I got the order of the parameters wrong. So sorry, it's uh, yes. So my constructor starts with the length. You can double check your constructor, like hold the control key and click on spring and you can see the order of the parameters because yours might be in a slightly different order than mine. Okay, so I've got a spring. I've connected blob one and blob two. Um, let's remove this business where we're accelerating them downwards. I don't want that anymore. Um, but what I do want is I want to say s dot move blobs. So this is now what's gonna accelerate the blobs. And then I wanna tell blob one to update, and I wanna tell blob two to update, and then I wanna tell blob one to draw, and I wanna tell blob two to draw. So I think I'm doing all the things now. Let's take a look. All right, oh, very bouncy. I would say maybe too bouncy. I like it. So because we chose all of our numbers kind of at random, um, you can see it's doing something like a spring, but maybe it's not terribly physically realistic yet. Um, but at least that was enough of a test to make sure that like we didn't get our forces backwards. Because if we got our forces backwards, you'd see the blobs like shooting away from each other, for example. Um, so again, like this is the kind of thing where like I'm moving in little tiny steps. I program a little bit and then I test it. And then I program a little bit and I test it. And you notice that the test situations that I'm setting up um, are like, they're, they just exist only for testing. Like I'm not trying to like make the final thing. <laughs> All right, uh, so this, the live stream is for my, is for my private class, but you're welcome to be in it. Um, but I'm not able to help you with a multiplayer game right now, sorry. <clears throat> All right, so we've tested the spring. Uh, hopefully we're feeling pretty good. So now I think we're, we're ready to actually hook up a whole bunch of these things. So let's go ahead and delete all the code that we used for testing. And we're ready to like fill our array lists with stuff. So I'm going to make a method, or let's do this actually. Instead of setting blobs to be a new array list, let's make a method for creating blobs. So make blob list. And then I'm gonna tell it how many blobs I want. And now, uh, you can have it auto-generate the method signature by hitting Alt-Enter, create the method. There we are. Uh, I is a terrible name. Let's call this numblobs. And now we're ready. So let's make an array list. And again, start practicing your tab completion here. So R tab, uh, B tab, and I'm gonna call this output. 
or just out, and then new array list. And now I want to loop a certain number of times and make some blobs. So I'm going to say for i tab, I'm going to loop up to num blobs tab, enter. And now let's say blob b equals new blob. And I guess let's make random x, y position and let's have it be a fixed size. So here I'm going to cast to int math.random times 800 and then int math.random times 800. Or you know what, let's actually, I don't want it to go all the way to the borders of the screen. Let's try and keep it like somewhat centered. So let's do 100 plus a number between zero and 600. Does that make sense? Yeah, so now like the smallest, the smallest coordinate is 100. The largest coordinate is 700. So that means I've created like a like a margin around the corners of my screen that's like a hundred pixel margin. Um, and then same thing here. Let's do one hundred plus math dot random times six hundred, and then let's create a size of like thirty or maybe ten, and then let's figure out what it's unhappy about. Expected two arguments but found three. What does my constructor look like? Oh, my bad. Oh, I need to create a P vector. Okay, so so I was making the X and Y coordinates here. Let's go ahead and make just a P vector called position and then paste that back in. So I've got my random X, I've got my random Y. Those are the inputs to P vector. And so now I'm creating my blob with the P vector. You know, that's sort of like a bad, it's sort of like bad for our API. You know, it's sort of awkward to have to create your own P vector. That's nonsense. Like probably, probably what we should do is um, like, like refactor or like add another constructor that takes an X and a Y and the constructor itself builds the P vector. Um, we're running like a little bit low on time. So I'm not going to do that right now, but that's probably the right thing to do. Okay, so what's happening? All right, so we've got our blobs. All right, so we're making a bunch of random blobs, but we have to actually add them to the output list. And then at the end, let's return the output list. Cool. Let's make the springs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess let's do this. I'm gonna make a method called make springs four and I'm gonna give it the blobs as an input. So I'm back up here now. So this is a method that takes a list of blobs and I'm gonna loop over every single pair of blobs and connect every single pair of blobs with a spring. And let's, I'm thinking ahead actually, let's, uh, let's define what the resting length of the springs are. So let's say all the springs are going to be resting length 200. All right, so let's create it. Blobs, so resting length. Um, so now, just like we did before, let's make an array list of spring objects, which I'll call springs. Practice your tab completion. Um, now we need the pattern where we like loop over all pairs of objects. So this now, this is like a, a very loose connection to what we have been doing recently. So hopefully you know this pattern. Uh, we're looping through the entire, nope, false. We're looping through the entire blobs list. And then for each, for each blob, we're gonna loop over all of the blobs that happen after that one in the list. So J is gonna start at I plus one and we're gonna to go to the, the end of the list. Great. Let's go ahead and get out the two blobs. So blob b1 equals blobs.get i, blob b2 equals blobs.get j. Uh, let's make a new spring. And the spring we need to give it, I forgot what, oh, give it the resting length and then blob one and blob two. And then let's add that spring to our list. Pause for a minute. 
And then at the end, let's return springs. So while I'm pausing, let me just kind of go back over what's happening here. So I made an empty list to hold all my springs. I'm looping over each pair of blob objects because I want everything connected to everything else by springs. I get the blob objects out of my list. I create a new spring object that connects those two springs together and I tell it what its, what its resting length should be and they all have the same resting length. And then I take that spring and I add it to my springs list and then at the very end, I return the springs list. So the last step here, like we're, we're like maybe three minutes away from testing this thing. Um, the last step is inside draw, we have to loop over all of the springs and tell them to exert their forces. Then we have to loop over all of the blobs and tell them to update their own positions and then to draw themselves. So let's go ahead and do that. And then I'll pause and you guys can, if you need to go backwards in the live stream, please go backwards in the live stream. So here we are in draw. Um, what do I want to do? Let's make some methods to keep this all clean. Uh, so I'm going to call this move blobs is the first thing that's going to happen. And I'm going to, whoops. I'm going to create method move blobs here. And, uh, you know, this is like a very lovely time to use a for each loop. Because really I just want to visit every single spring in my list. So let's say for spring s springs. And remember, this is going to take each spring from the list one at a time and assign it to this variable. And so now I can say s.moveBlobs. Cool, so that was pretty straightforward. I'm moving all the blobs. So now that I've moved all the blobs, oh, actually, I guess, uh, I guess under move blobs, let's actually move the blobs. <laughs> then it won't be such a misleading name. So this is like accelerating all the blobs. It's adding all the forces from the springs. Um, but remember to move them, we actually have to run the update position method on each one. So now let's use a for each loop, loop, loop over all blobs, v.update position. And again, notice all of this tab completion, all of this auto completion that's happening. So now let's say draw blobs is gonna be the second thing that happens to create that method. And same thing, let's loop over each blob and v.draw with this window. All right, let's run it. And it's going to require a little bit of tweaking. Cool. Not that much tweaking. Okay, so that's like cool and all, um, but what I really wanna do, let me tell you what this is used for now that we have five minutes left. Um, so this is used for something called a force-directed layout. Uh, let me try and find up force, hold on, force-directed. Uh, it's also called a force-directed graph. So let's just look at Wikipedia for the moment. So force-directed graph drawing. If you've ever seen visualizations like this that show like uh, a social network, so like who's friends with who, or like maybe you've seen stuff that have to do with uh, like a semantic network, like what words have to do with what other words. Um, you can imagine each of these circles as a point mass and the lines as springs. Um, and the way that you decide like what is a good way of organizing all of the circles you know, if, if you only have a couple of circles, you could have a human decide how to lay it out on the screen. Um, but the way that large pictures like this work, um, you know, it's not an accident that these big ones are in the center and the small ones are, are at the periphery. What's happened is it's arrived at this visual organization by actually pretending that each node is a mass and each line is a spring and it runs a simulation just the way that we're doing right now. Um, and that's what's called a force-directed graph drawing. Um, and there's, you know, as usual, there's like a thousand fancy variations. 
So a lot of the time they don't just think about the forces as being springs. You can also think about sort of like electrical forces in the objects and like those forces uh, sort of like have a different, like they fall off over, over spatial distance as a squared function. I don't know. Anyway, it's not important. Um, the important thing is like you can continue to tinker with this. Um, but this is like one of the uses for what I've just showed you beyond just being pretty pictures. Let me let me show you kind of one last thing you can do because right now it's cool to watch them all bounce around, um, but they're not forming a stable layout. So I want to show you what can you do to make them sort of have a stable layout over time. So a couple of things. Um, let's go to blob and let's give blobs a maximum speed. So at the top, let's say uh, private static final float max speed equals and let's figure out, you know, some maximum speed. Uh, and let's add drag. So that so drag is like uh, as something is moving, it's like it's like decelerating over time just naturally. Um, like that's sort of it's not necessarily super physically realistic, but it's going to be an effect that's like drag. So let's make private static final float drag. And what I want to do is I want to, like every single frame, whatever speed it's going at, I want it to reduce its speed by 2%. So I want to go at 98% of whatever speed it used to be going at. So now down inside update, we can figure out what the new velocity is, but before we have the velocity affect the position, let's multiply the velocity by the drag. So reduce velocity by 2%. So when, you're mul when you scale vectors, it's still pointed in the same direction. All we did was we shortened it by 2% of its current length. Um, and then the next thing we want to do is we want to say if velocity.magnitude, so if its current speed is greater than max speed, then let's set its magnitude, whoops, then let's set its magnitude to be whatever the max speed is. So if it's going faster than it should, let's set it to be the maximum. We have one minute left before class is over. So I'm just gonna run it real quick to make sure that it's doing something sensible. Cool, so now you can, so you can see that now that we've like slowed the speeds down, they find kind of a stable resting spot. Um, and if you wanna do, you know, and if you wanna go wild now, like you don't have to make, you don't have to make 10 blobs, you could make like 100 blobs. Ah, oh, very nice. Très bon. <coughs> that is very pleasant. That makes me feel great to look at. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed our day of live coding. Um, your only homework is going to be to fill out a brief reflection about this, which you can find in your Schoology assignments. Um, and like mostly I just want to know kind of you know, like, what are your main takeaways here? Like, did you learn anything about how you make objects, how you organize objects, how code can be clean, about the programming process, any of those things? Uh, thank you guys so much. Taiwan, nice to see you. Um, I will see you guys next time. And next time it's like, you know, back to normal class, like real Zoom. Uh, we're going to be learning about big O and big theta, which are very, very important concepts in computer science. So I hope you're excited. Bye, everybody. I'm going to stop the stream.